Good morning. What a wonderful time of worship. Hope you, you know, you don't, you didn't take that for granted because uh, just a little coaching, little, little uh, informational, inspirational moment. Uh, you moved into instrumental worship. I don't know if you picked that up or not, but when, and it's not about, you know, Tom being a good, great guitar player. I'm sure he is. I felt some deep purple in that. Uh, but, well, what he, he moved into a spiritual manifestation of worship. The Bible says the rocks will cry out, but also we can use all of God's creation to create worship back to Him, and that's what happened there. So just wanted to let you know, uh, if you're sitting there and you're soaking it in, you're hearing that, and you're going, man, that's pretty, he's pretty good. It really causes us to pause and then reflect on the goodness of God and who God is through the instruments. So just so you know, when you worship, it, if you're singing, great. If you're not singing, that's fine too. Sometimes God does more in the silence than he does in the, in the noise. And there's other times that he uses instruments, the drum, the saxophone, the, the guitar. So uh, it's a great handprint, fingerprint of the Lord this morning. So it's been good to be in his presence already. I'm going to try not to mess it up because it's been that good. So we're going to talk in the next couple of weeks. I get two weeks with you. I'm so excited I get two weeks. Now, some of you are going, oh, bro, no. But uh, I just appreciate the fact that I get to build on something that's really been put on my heart, and I'm going to kind of use Barb as my intro. Uh, I think uh, you, you're right on on this inner healing thing, and you're, you know that's my opinion. But when you said unhindered relationship, I believe that is today's biggest challenge in our faith, is working through unhindered relationship. When Jesus came to this earth and led us in this life, he didn't, he didn't do that so that we could become more righteous. He didn't do it so that we could become more religious. He did that, become, that we could become more relational with him, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And the biggest thing that hinders our growth, I believe, in, in life, in church, is this idea of relationship. So we're going to kind of do a page break here, uh, kind of go back and uh, kind of Christianity 101. So some of you may go, wow, I've already been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. What I'm hoping is, is that we'll go slow enough, and uh, after 40 years of doing this, then maybe I'll pick up a few nuggets myself, and we'll pause and just ask some hard questions Maybe some easy questions, but we'll ask some questions about how we really are with the Lord relationally. Are we just trying to check off our church box? Are we just trying to check off our, uh, you know, our spiritual, uh, our spiritual box or our family box? Are we living life robotically or are we living life through relationship? Now, you're going to hear me say this over and over for the next couple of weeks. I believe and this is after spending some time being in the fast lane of life, type A kind of person. I believe life should be lived at the speed of relationship. If you're doing things and there is no relationship in that, quit doing them. I've never seen a hearse pull a U-Haul. So the things that we're trying to do to impress people that we don't know with money that we don't have is not working. It's the reason we feel as shallow as we do is we're spending money we don't have to impress people we don't like. And there's no relationship in it. Ask yourself this question. At the end of your life, who do you want around your table? You want the HR department at your table? You know, you want the... I mean, there's oh, HR is okay, but it's uh, it, we want people at the end of around our table that uh, speak life to us, and we speak life to them. Uh, so life moves at the speed of relationship. We're going to start with a, a few scriptures just to kind of whet your appetite. John 15, 1 through 8 says this, New King James, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. The light in that already, that it may bear more fruit. So there's going to be pain in your growth. 
You're going to be pain in the relationship. So sometimes we're getting cut on and uh, we think God doesn't love us and what he's doing is just preparing us for a new season of growth. Ooh, that'll preach. Hang on there. You're already clean because the word which I have spoken to you abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So you see there's a relationship already, vine, branches coming together. Try to grow fruit with a branch that's not attached to the, to the trunk or to the vine. Uh, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches, who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Not a maybe, not a hopefully, but bears much fruit. It's a declaration. You ought, to, you ought to study the Bible through declarations, by the way. Just giving you some help here. You want to grow in your faith, study the declarations that are in the Bible. The will do happen. The can happen. The Not the might, not the some, but the all and the will. I am the vine, you are the branches. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. So there is a choice here to be made. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The abiding process. Now I'm going to just take a, take a commercial break here. As a, I'm a bona fide charismatic Pentecostal. They don't come near as crazy as I am. Sometimes I'm even Pentecostal. I'll just tell you right up front. I don't make any bones about it. My reform buddies don't like that. When I get into an ecumenical service, they don't like my style. That's why I don't have many of them. We have great relationship with them in their place and me in my place. Hey, there's different tribes in the kingdom. I don't mind the big kingdom, and I don't mind, but if, if I just tell you, Full bore Pentecostal charismatic. Don't don't make any bones about it. Believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. Don't think any of them didn't. I don't think any of them vaporized while while we we got on the planet. I think we need them more now than we ever needed them. Okay, you you with me? Yes. Amen. I'm going to say that because now the next statement is going to feel like I'm not Pentecostal. There's times that we that we trade the abiding as we seek the anointing. And we go from 4th of July service to 4th of July service to 4th of July service. And it's basically because we're bored Monday through Friday and we got to get up to Sunday church so we can pump up our faith again. And we'll do that through the gifts of the Spirit or some sort of Pentecostal manifestation. Again, I'm Pentecostal. I don't mind telling you that I'm not. But if we avoid the abiding... If we sacrifice the abiding for the anointing, then we're shallow and we're immature and we'll get off on our own. And what will happen is the anointing will become an idol, something God intended to bring growth and, 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 and maturity into our lives will become something that creates, creates an immaturity and a stunted growth in our, in our existence. Are you still there? So the abiding is so important that we abide in Him, that we lead through relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John 15, 15 through 17. No longer do I call you servants. He's already letting you know it's going to be relational. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. Friends is a relational term. For all these things that I heard from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and, per, and bear fruit. And we're seeing a theme here, right? That there's relationship and the abiding and the, and the abiding principle. And then there's fruit that comes in our lives are fruit and are, are full of fruit bearing uh, activities. There's, ac there's action and there's activity in our behavior as we are characteristically relating to the Father. The fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you may love one another. Again, that's another relational term. It's kind of hard to be in a relationship if you hate each other. It's called adversarial relationship. It's not very good. All right, one more. Romans 8, 12 through 17. My life scripture. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. I love the truth of the word, don't you? We live in a world now where we're just supposed to love everybody and just kind of just choke it down. 
If it's something we don't agree with, you, you know, if you say anything bad about it, then, uh, then you're not being a very good Christian because we're just supposed to love. Let me tell you something, we're supposed to love. We're supposed to outlove everybody on the planet. But every time you read Scripture, there is some, there's some definite strength of correction in every Scripture that we read. Don't live according to the flesh because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, that's so harsh. No, that's just true. The spirit you put to, but by the Spirit you put death, the deeds of the body you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. This is an introduction to relationship again. You're no longer a servant, but you're a son. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, which is, by the way, the Old Testament version was you feared God, because he would strike you. But you receive the spirit of adoption by where we cry out, Abba, Father. Again, a relational term. Are you still there? The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children, children of God. And if children, then heirs, a relational term. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, a relational term. If indeed we suffer with Him, that's relationship, that we may also be glorified together. Which is just telling you, our life's going to have some bumps in it, right? I mean, some of us uh, are suffering. Somebody in this room is probably not having the best of their of the best time in their life. There's people that are trying to struggle through their finances. There's people that are working through some relationships. There are people that are between jobs or they don't like the job they're, they're in. There's people that have some, some family difficulties. There's going to be some sufferings as we go. There may be people dealing with persecution in their job or in their uh, in, you know, in their workplace or in their marketplace where they're being condemned for just standing up and being a believer. I've looked at Facebook a lot, and some of us are, being, are, are, are actually being tarred and feathered regularly just because of who we are and what we say, what we believe. So there's sufferings, but indeed you suffer with him that you may also be glorified together. Weeping is only for a moment. The joy of the Lord will be forever. Amen. So we're going to deep dive into this. You ready? Because the world we live in, the church that we're the church that we're associated with, don't take it personal unless you need to. The world that we live in, the church that we're associated in mostly, and the families that we exist in are absent of this biblical New Testament principle of relationship. More families, more churches, and this world is grinding it out all by themselves. Most of us are dealing with anger, hostility, some bitterness. Most of, our most of our conversation, if we're not careful, is about what's not right about things. Are you still there? Let me just tell you this. The New Testament believer is a high-level relational being. The New Testament believer, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't help but be relational. Unless the enemy has come in and, and thwarted that idea in your life. You've, got, you've been bound up with oppression or something of this nature. That's why inner healing is going to be good. The individual, Jesus came to heal the lost, right? To, to, to save the lost. He's willing that no one would perish. Salvation is a one-on-one -on -one event. Do you believe that? I mean, he may save all of everybody in this room, but he'll save us. He'll save everybody one at a time. You don't get saved because you know somebody. God didn't have any grandkids. He didn't have any uncles, aunts, cousins. He has friends, and he has sons, and he has daughters. They're individuals. He's willing that no one would perish. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a salvation experience. That's the time, at that time, listen, at that time, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let me tell you what one of the new things are. Yes. I'm trying to get my English correct. It's hard enough being from Texas. you got to get some of this stuff right, you know? At that moment, we enter into an eternal relationship. At that moment, you may say, well, you don't know where I've come from. At that moment, the Bible says all things have become new. All things have the possibility of change. All things in your life have been wiped away, and now we can walk in new freedom. At that moment, we become relational people. Now, this is somewhat anecdotal, but I'll use my own life. Growing up as a, as a, a child of adoption, uh, you know, I had great parents, but I still had this rejection, this bitterness in my heart, and it caused me to build some barriers around me with people. 
In fact, when Lynn and I were first dating, when I fell in love with her, she'd say, what are you thinking about? And I'd say, well, the price of tea in China. Because I didn't want to say L -l -l love. Because that meant, that meant vulnerability. And I wasn't ready for sure that I wanted to be vulnerable. I didn't know what I hadn't thought. It hadn't all rewired in my head yet. I hadn't thought about, figured this all out. Still trying to work on it after 60 years. But anyway, it wasn't until we came into a full spirit walk and a full healing in our heart that I could say I'm deeply and madly in love with you. And I find myself in love with you more and more every day. People say, oh, I know that's cheesy. I'm just telling you, she's my best friend. I love her. I like being around her. She makes me a better person. She's just a wonderful person. Now, I can say that because of the Holy Spirit that is within me. At the same time, in that time in my life, I wasn't very close to a lot of people. I had a lot of relationships, knew a lot of people in sales and marketing. You know, I had the smile on, on your face, a handshake. We're from Texas. We look you in the eye. We shake your hand firmly. And, uh, you know, was in sports, had a team concept, so I understood that it took more than just me to get the world done. But it was uh, dog eat dog world, baby. And at the inside of me was anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and judgment. And people would walk away and I would, I would have winners and losers in my thought process very quickly. But with the moment that Jesus became real to me and the Holy Spirit and filled me with, with, his, with his presence, I, f I just fell in love with the human race. It was so genuine. It was kind of shocking it was that genuine. It's like, wow, I really do like you. I don't even know why I like you. I'm not used to liking you. It's kind of weird to like you. That's what happens at the point of true salvation, folks, is God made us relational. He wanted sons and daughters. There's a lot of ways people still made it to heaven or in the presence of God before Jesus got here. There were not everybody was going to hell. There was that place of waiting, you know. In that moment, your spiritual relationship, your relationship switch is turned on. It is flipped. And from that moment on, from salvation on to death, we are relational people. We're never out of relationship. So here's the deal. If we're out of relationship right now, something's up. We say, well, I just don't, I, you know, I'm just, I'm okay. I don't, I'm an introvert. Well, you're a relational introvert. If you're a Christian, you're a relational introvert. Because you got to like Jesus anyway, Right? So there has to be this relationship that we come through. From the moment of salvation to the moment of death, we will nurture this relationship. Now, here's the problem. The world wants to rob you of a relationship. And sometimes, hey, let's get this skunk on the table. Sometimes the church wants to rob you of a relationship. Not every church loves everybody. Have you, do you understand what I'm saying? The body, the armor of God is in our front. We've got nothing in our back because we're supposed to be protecting somebody. But how many of you have had that moment where the knife came from a friend and the relationships weren't there? A pastor let you down or a deacon let you down. Somebody in church told you a lie. You were defrauded. You were in business together. This happens over and over and over again. So there's this temptation to draw away. We said a long time ago, Lynn and I said a long time ago, we will not avoid people in the store. Even people that left for really wrong reasons. I'm just going to tell you, I've been a pastor a long time. People come in, people leave. I've never liked it when you left. Even if you were supposed to leave, I didn't like it. I'm just tell you right up front. Took it personal. Shouldn't have, but I did. But we didn't try to avoid you at Costco. Oh, no, there's Tom. You know, Tom, he's a snake. <laughs> We're just not going to live life that way. I mean, Tom and I may have some issues, but I'm going to go right up to Costco and Tom, and I'm going to say, Tom, how you doing? It's good to see you, you snake. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I'm using you because you know it ain't true. Many hearts are wanting salvation without much change of heart. We're wanting to kind of do this alone. 
without much involvement of the Holy Spirit or anybody else. People, if they aren't close to you, they won't hurt you, but they won't ever help you either. What do we say around here? You may go alone, you'll grow weird if you grow weird alone or something. I don't know, something like that. The church was born for relationship. Now, I'm not talking about new life, but I am talking about the modern day church. We've missed the mark. Right now, we're having fellowship at the back of somebody else's head. We had two minutes where we greeted each other, some of us. There are times a church gets this size that there are people that are actually here. Don't take offense to this. There are people that come in so it's big enough we can hide because we're carrying some hurt with us. That's not God's plan. Acts chapter 2, they were in unity and in one accord and in prayer. You think they may have had an issue or two? Let's, let's just rewind the tape, okay? Let's just rewind the tape. One of them had betrayed. He was gone, committed suicide. That's what they've got. Jesus has been in and out, kind of like a bad TV commercial. Now he's been back. They've kind of got the, the, the people ranked together, and uh, they're hoping they're now going to start taking charge. And then he leaves again. And they've got a, a de denier in there that's trying to take uh, charge of things. You know, charismatic Peter, he denied the Lord. The Lord restored him. Don't you think there was some back office talk about that? Hey, I've been on some staffs before. We're like, whoa, how did that, that happen? How did you ever let Peter have another chance at that? How did you let Simon Peter get back to the front of the line like that? Who's called him a leader? He's lost his leadership gift. He had his chance. He denied the Lord. Well, everybody who's saying that never even got a close to denying the Lord because they ran. <laughs> you got a doubter in there. I won't, do, I won't believe it until I put my hands in the scars that I see. So you, you don't have the unity builders in the room. But yet they were in unity and in one accord. And the Holy Spirit fell on some of them. Wait a minute. You guys are reading the Word. The Holy Spirit fell upon all of them. All of them. It was a relational moment, folks. God didn't just plant the Holy Spirit and go, okay, we're going to give you a break. Nope, you're done. You're a second-class citizen. Nope. Oh, you'd never use the gifts right anyway. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you oh, you got to go to leadership one-on-one -on -one for that one. Oh, you're not ready for the Holy Spirit. Oh, but you are. He didn't have thems and thous and, and, and some and not. He had everybody. The Holy Spirit fell upon each of them. They all encountered the relational correct, uh, connection. Acts chapter 2, the characteristics of the early church. You ready? They were committed together in teaching, growing, and learning. They were committed together in community. They met in the house and, and from house to house and in the temple. They were committed together in fellowship, true koinonia, breaking bread. They were committed together in communication. They prayed together. There were two or three as gathered together as touching anything. They had all things in common. They shared all things with everyone. They had community. And the Lord added to the church daily those who had been saved. Does that sound a little bit relational? Let's turn the page 2,000 years. I'm not sure that the church isn't guilty of seeking the gift and not the gift giver. I think we've made some of our service and our worship about us and not him. Do you know that we all experience corporate worship together and we'll never have that moment again? And some of us didn't join the party because they didn't like the music or the style, or they didn't like Deep Purple. You know, they didn't like old Led Zeppelin on the thing. And we missed the opportunity to have community of worship. The moment where the pastor got up and said, he read out a revelation, said this is a holy convocation, a holy moment. We had a chance to surrender our hearts again to the, to the true and living God. We had a chance to realign our spirit to Him. What a moment that was. And some of us may have just sit back and go, I'm not doing it because I don't like the guitar. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not, really, I'm not trying to 
pick a stick here. I'm not really trying to pick a scab, but I'm just saying sometimes our service, our involvement, our introspection, our worship, even the word, the, the style. Some of you are looking at me, I don't like this guy. He uses a new King James and he talks too fast. Am I saying the truth or not? It's really what we need to be evaluating. Ready? Some of us in church today are ready to move over any excuse. The kids ministry is not what it used to, what, not what it needs to be. I always said, we'll just get involved and make it better. Well, I don't like the youth ministry. Well, then do something about it. Get involved in youth. You're so good. You've written books, I'm sure. Get in there. <laughs> you know, before as a young pastor, I go, oh, please don't leave. Please don't do that. Now, you know, after about 40 years, you get a little bit, you know, salty. You don't like the youth group? Well, I don't like the youth group either, so do something about it. I mean, Pastor Aaron is probably needing some help. So go help him. Don't criticize him. Don't throw rocks from the bleachers. Anybody at a high school football game or a, or a university game could throw anything on the field, and they don't reflect any kind of talent at all. It takes absolutely no much energy to throw a tortilla at Texas Tech. <laughs> wow, you really made a difference there, buddy. Well, I don't like the worship. Well, get involved. Well, I, I, don't, I don't like the, the guitar. Well, then don't play it. I don't like, the, I don't like a, a man to stand on this side. She should stand on this side. Well, then move. If you're on this side and you want her on that side, then you move to that side. There's ways that we can find to not have the excuse. Usually the excuse that we use to leave church isn't the excuse at all. It's usually there's a lot of things going on in my life, and I really can't blame my wife or my husband. I really can't blame my kids. I really can't blame the job. I'm going to blame the, blame the church. Very few of us leave because of doctrinal issues. Some of us are propped up in our services. We're easy to be offended. We're saying yes to God and no to everything else. But our entire world, according to Acts chapter 2, at the church is to be relational. Let me just give you a grow-up word, okay? Let me give you a grown-up word. Are you ready for this? Not everybody thinks the way you think. Not everybody believes the way you believe. Not everybody hopes the way you hope, prays the way you pray. There's a lot of tribes. There's a lot of flavors in the church. There's a, it's a lifesaver package. And sometimes we don't, like, we don't like lime. But I'm just telling you, without lime, you don't have lifesavers. You got to have lime in there. I only want cherry. You know what? If you found only a cherry church, you're going to get real bored in a hurry. You're going to get sick of cherries in a hurry. Are you still there? Let's look at the world. The world was never supposed to be relational. It was never supposed to be relational, but there were moments that had some fabric in our world, in our society, that made us relational, that helped us in relationship. Families lived in the same area from generation to generation. We were agrar agrarian for many, many years. And, uh, my family grew up on a farm. Uh, my, dad, my dad's dad uh, was, was a farmer. He became a farmer. You know, they, 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 they lived in the same area. Cousins lived in the same area. I went to school, the same school that my, gra that my mother graduated from. You, th you couldn't get away with anything in that school because she already had... She already knew everybody. I could come home. I lived in a small town in Texas. I would come home, and, and she would be waiting at the door. I know where you've been, and I know what you've been doing. Oh, I hated that. But you know what? It kept me out of trouble. Our family stayed together. My dad went to, uh, uh, went to Korea, and after Korea, went back to the Panhandle of Texas. He worked for Phyllis Petroleum until he retired. One job, one place. I grew up in the same town, in the same house. We don't do that anymore. Linda and I have moved probably 30 times. I mean, Jeffrey's home has been Texas and, and uh, Washington and Idaho and, da -da and this and that. We, uh, the fabric of our society is drawn away from relationship. Now we have, uh, you know, uh, that online stuff. Uh, uh, what do you call that when you talk to each other online? Facetime. Yeah, Facetime. Man, you guys got a lot of other things I don't know about. But <laughs> so the world today, it's a world of isolationism. 
We live virtually. My son-in-law works from his home. I'm convinced that if his father-in-law and mother-in-law didn't push him out of the nest from time to time, that he'd be a hermit. But we're relational individuals, so this is how we roll. I pay my bills online. I tithe online. I bank online. I go, I, we used to go and pay our utility bill. We pay that online. I, I, we have lim eliminated all normal kind of relational transactions. I remember growing up, you'd go to the store. You had a tab. You had a tab. They, they would run your tab for you. And when you got paid, then they would come in and they would pay the tab and have a conversation about the kids or the dog or church or politics or all the things we're not supposed to talk about. Now Walmart just brings it to the house. I'm not against any of it. I'm just telling you, our world has isolated and virtual living and online living and at-home jobs and virtual video games. I've got grandkids that live in two or three different states. And they think they're in a relationship because they farm the same area online. <laughs> I don't have the heart to tell them that's not a relationship. And ever since COVID, it's even been more challenged. We've, now we've become angry and more angry and bitter and more conflicted. And 2 Timothy says this, the last two, in the last days, they will we'll become lovers of ourselves, we'll lovers of money, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power, learning and never discovering the truth. There'll be this perpetual, perpetual motion in our life. So what's the change? What's going to have to, what's going to, have to change? Well, what has to change, folks, is we've got to move our hearts from a heart of stone back to a heart of flesh. We've got to be able to receive the Word of God, even when it stings. Mark chapter 4 talks about a parable that you, are, that you all know. Hang in there. We're going to be done in just a minute because I got, I got part two next week. Mark chapter 4 says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened that he sowed, and some fell upon the wayside. Some of the seed fell upon the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seeds fell upon good ground, and it yielded crop that sprang up, increased, and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. And he said to them, Who has ears, let him hear. Nobody understood what he was saying. So he interprets the, the, uh, the four grounds. He interprets it, uh, uh, he, he translates the parable in verse, uh, chapter th in verse 13. Do not, do you not understand this parable? How will you then understand all parables? Well, that's why we have you. Then the sower sows the word. So the sower is Jesus sowing the word, the Holy Spirit sowing the word, the word of God. When they hear it, Satan comes immediately and it takes away the word and it was sown in their hearts. Likewise, the ones that are sown on stoning ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it. You've been there? You immediately receive it. That's a great idea. I think I'm going to do that. And they had no root in themselves. And so they endure only for a time afterwards when the tribulation or persecution arises. For the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter to choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, hear the word, accept the word, and bear fruit. I mean, it's going to help you out. Your ground is not good if there's not fruit in your life. We read it in John. We read it in Romans. And now we're reading it again. This is a relational fruit-bearing sermon. 30-fold, some 100-fold. So you have these four grounds, right? One is the wayside ground. If you've done any farming, you understand there's paths that you walk around. If you've done any gardening, you, you don't plant the whole garden plot. You have to have some paths that you walk around to get to the inside of the garden, right? And when seeds hit that, there's no kind of, there's no kind of receiving of that. It's hard. It's like hard pan. It's, uh, it's like concrete. And the birds of the air come and get them. And this is a wayward heart. This is a wayward ground that is a secular mind. So we get saved, but our mind 
does not get renewed. So we know Jesus, but we're still all plugged in to the world. And we have a secular mind. So you come with a secular mind as a born again believer. You bring a secular mind into a service. You hear the word and it makes absolutely no sense. Now, there may be some people today that are listening to me and they turn me off about 30 seconds, 30 seconds into it because it's not making any sense. It's not because my words are bad. It's not because my accent is different. It's because there's a waywardness, there's a hardness in our heart, and we cannot see and receive the Word. The Holy Spirit does not penetrate your heart to give you the Word. He lets seed go into your heart so that you'll receive it and you'll grow with it. Are you still there? It also says that Satan comes in. So this is where the spiritual warfare of life really takes effect. There's some of us that we're trying real hard, but we're in a secular mindset. We've not been conformed. We're not been transformed by the renewing of our mind to show what that perfect, acceptable and perfect will of God is. We've been still conformed to this world. We're walking in church. We're, we're involved in relationship kind of, but our minds are still frozen in a secular mindset thought. And that is Satan's enemy, that is Satan's playground to mess with your head. And if he can mess with your head, then the Lord will never have your heart. As long as Satan lives in your head, the Lord will never have your heart. Mark it down. As long as, you know, I believe in gravity. But look at what we're doing right now. We're changing science today. Things that we used to say are scientific data. Just write it down and all with it will always be always. We're making those changes now. I didn't know this, but X and Y chromosomes can be different now. I thought it meant that you were, uh, you know, if you had two X's, that you were a, a female. If you had an X and a Y, that you were a male. But now, for some reason, we've decided that's not real. We've made a, a, a business decision. We've made a secular decision. And, and now we're supposed to, as believers, believers who know that God created male and female. Are you listening to me? He created man and woman. He created them differently on purpose. And he put in their DNA, XX, XY. And from that moment on, it is always going to be set in stone. And we receive that in our heart as truth. And now if we say anything about it, well, then we're not being very kind. And I'm going to just say this once, and then I'm going to get off this little horse. But anytime you have two men that are winning, that are, that are boxing for a gold medal in the Olympics, we've lost our way. And I know I'm going to offended somebody right there. I'm sorry, not for offending you, but I'm sorry that you're taking an offense. The wayside ground, Satan comes in, steals the word, the birds of the air, spiritual warfare is real. Folks, some of us need to wake up and realize that sometimes we're not growing because the enemy has got a better foothold on us than the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying everything's a demon. Boy, please hear me. I'm not saying you've got to blame everything in your life as a spirit of this and a spirit of that, but I am telling us some of us have been so secularized in our mind that we cannot get out of our own way because the enemy has got a stronghold, that, a foothold that turned into a stronghold that's an obsession and oppression, the stronghold that's an obsession we can't get rid of without a deliverance. When the strong man comes in, the stronger man has to come in and root him out in the name of Jesus. And then we have to change our hearts and our lives. The heart can't receive what the enemy is controlling in your head. Then if that stony ground had not much earth, many rocks. How many of us today have a few rocks in our heart? Some relational blocks. Walking in some hurt. Some unforgiveness, some bitterness, some anger. This is a tough one. They hear the word. And he immediately received the word. The word, they, they have no ability to root in the word, to personalize it. They endure for a short time. The sun comes up, persecution comes in, and it lengthens their time of falling backwards, but they end up falling backwards anyway. I used to work uh, with uh, addicts a lot. And we always thought if we just talked enough, they'd get, they'd get better. The falsity of counseling. Words themselves will not change a life. Words powered by the Holy Spirit can change the destiny of an individual. But just words, because I'm smiling, aren't going to help you. 
So I would talk to them, and I would think, you know, we'd take care of them. We'd go clean their house. We'd take care of their kids. We'd get them new clothes. We'd put new shoes on them. We'd do everything. Our home groups would come together. We were doing the work of ministry, and we really were. I mean, our compassion was there. We were doing everything we needed to do to help. And the addict would go from two weeks to three, and he'd relapse, and then he'd go to a month. We'd get them out of 45 days and think, man, we've, we're making some headway. We've got some. But then the cloud would roll back in because the stony ground hadn't been dealt with. There's abuse. There's tragedy. There are people in here that are hiding in the forest of hurt. And we're moving from tree to tree thinking we're getting better. And then there's stony ground. I don't know how to help you get out of hardship outside of just surrendering to the Holy Spirit and the Lord. Things are going to get hot. Tribulation is going to come. Difficulty is going to happen. Hardships are going to come. Commitment is going to happen. Uh, a non-committed person is going to come into your life. Then you have the thorny ground, seeds that take root. This is a scary ground, they, the weeds that grow. So they start. They, they take root. The, 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 the weeds grow next to the plant. So you think you're in kind of a relationship and the ability of the plant to make any fruit doesn't happen because this says the cares of the world come in. Some of us today are so focused in on the stock market we can't live. We're so focused in on the 401k that we're just we're, we're frozen in time. We can't afford this, we can't afford that. And it has nothing to do with your wealth or the ability to make wealth. It has the ability of your mind, the cares of the world. I've got a great friend who's got a lot, a lot of money. I just say it's, it's well over several million. And he's retired now, and now he's having to take his money out of the things that he put his money into, and he's freaking out just a little bit. So it's not about the amount, it's about the process of control, of cares of the world, of worry and anxiety and difference between the area of concern and influence. I have a lot of things I'm concerned about, but I have a very few things that I'm influenced that I can really influence. I can influence my own attitude. I can influence my own way of, of thinking. I can influence how I'm going to respond to something. I have a lot of concern about a lot of things. But I have influence over a few things. I need to worry less, have less anxiety, the cares of the world. It says the deceitfulness of riches. How many know that riches are deceitful? They'll lie to you. Put some money in your pocket, walk around, you think you got plenty. You walk around, you don't have any money in your pocket. You take all your credit cards out. All of a sudden, you get a little, a little worried, a little nervous. Somehow, we prop up our lives with the riches of our life. We think that that's going to help us be better if we have more things and, and the desire of other things. Why do you think God said it's good to tithe? You think he needs your money? He needs you to let go of it. That's what he needs. He needs you to not have the, the desire for so many things that you forget about God in the process. That's the whole reason he told us about tithing to begin with. There's the give to him first. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek God first and then you won't have the deceitfulness of riches. You know, Linda and I have had, had many opportunities to move from place to place. We never made, now this is not bragging, it's just the truth. Sometimes it's not very smart. We never made a decision based upon income. In fact, one of the jobs I took is, that I don't care what you pay, we're coming. Uh, man, I've lost all the ability to negotiate right there. <laughs> we had heard the Lord. The desire for other things to choke out the word, yet sometimes we don't, we don't have a relationship because we desire other things. I want my time. I want, I, I want uh, my things. I want my stuff. I want, I'm going to make idols out of stuff I, that's important to me. And relationships just not one of those. Relationship to the Lord, relationship to, to God, relationship to others, relationship to the church. I just, it just chokes out the word. I become unfruitful. And there's good ground. And we're going to talk about this next week. There's good ground. The good ground is those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. They hear the word. I can remember being on the front row. Right where you guys are. Lynn and I didn't want anybody between us and the pastor because we wanted to hear what he had to say. And you guys sometimes can be distracting, by the way. I just want you to know that. So we were there in the front row, and I can remember hearing the word on tithing, hearing the word on giving and tithing. And I'm doing all the finances in our life, and we're doing okay, but the idea of giving 10% away of anything to anybody for any reason just didn't occur to me. 
Linda hears it with the good heart. And so she immediately says, we need to do this. I hear it with a thorny heart. I'm like, we need to pray about this. We need to consider this. I need to go home and do the math. I've got, we've got budgets to do. You know, we got, when do we tie on the first fruit? Now, wait a minute. I paid the, we pay our house rent. We pay our house, our mortgage on the first. I, 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 wait, we just got to figure this out, honey. I'm not, and she'll look at me and she'll, Rob, it's in the word. We need to tie. We're having this discussion on the front row of the church. I'm like, can you not wait till we get to the car like everybody else? <laughs> That's back in the day when you brought your checkbook with you, by the way. The desire for the good ground. How are you hearing the word today? How are you hearing the word? Is it good ground? Is it broken up soil? Spend a little time on the farm. Is the blade hit the soil? You know, sometimes that hurts. Think about the ground getting farmed. Ow! First thing it hits is a plow. Well, first of all, you got to disc it, and then you got to plow it. I mean, it's pretty abusive at first, right? It's not like we're going to water it and tender it and bless it and love it and pray over it and lay hands on it. Gonna, we're going to put a disc on it, something really sharp that goes round and round and round. And then we're going to put a, a, a plow on it, something that's got steel and it's going to penetrate the soil and it's going to turn it all over. And what was top is going to be bottom now. What was bottom is going to be top. You think your life's a mess? We're going to till it up. We're going to clean out the weeds. We're going to get out there and we're going to rogue weeds. We're going to take it all in. We're going to take the rocks out, the caliche, the, the, the clods. We're going to bust up the clods. What do you think they call them? Sod busters. Because they're going to, they're going to do all that. They're going, to, they're going to till the ground. They're going to work the ground. They're going to remove the rocks. They're going to get ready for the seed of relationship. Okay, we're going to come to a close right here. You ready? You want good ground? Walk in forgiveness. I'd like to make this a little harder. You want good ground? Walk in forgiveness. Right now, just forgive everybody you can. And those that you can't, forgive them tomorrow. Keep a short list. I'm going to promise you there are plenty of reasons not to forgive. The ground will never get receiving the word until there's forgiveness. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You still there? Walk in forgiveness. Walk in obedience. Don't raise your hand, but how many is right now, the Lord's already said a couple of things that we need to do that we're going, I'm going to take that under advisement. Don't raise your hand. You might look down. But obedience. The Bible says obedience is far better than sacrifice, right? So we walk in obedience. Let bitterness be gone. Let forgiveness come. Surrender to judgment and control. Some of us just need to let go. We're kind of like the guy who fell off the cliff and he was hanging on by one little branch. He started crying out, I need help. God, will you help me? Please help me. Silence. Oh, God, please help me. Help me. And finally, he heard a voice. This is the Lord. I'm here to help. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What shall I do? How will you help me? Let go. Is there anybody else? <laughs> some of us need to let go of some control. We need to be led by the Spirit. And lastly, we need to find the joy of the Lord. You know, we can't take our circumstances and change them. I'm not going to all of a sudden make more money. All of a sudden be a better looking guy. I'm not going to be 6'4 tomorrow. I'm not going to be able to dunk a basketball. It's really a shame. But I'm going to find joy in my existence. And the joy is going to till up that ground. So whatever comes my way, because no weapon formed against me will prosper, whatever comes my way is going to be good. Because God is a good God. Amen? All right, are we ready for next week now? I'm right at 11.59. I think we're supposed to get done at 12, right? So anything after this is on you, Pastor G. Because I've let these people go. Lord, bless this church today. Bless these people. Thank you for such a wonderful experience of worship today. Father, I pray the word would penetrate our hearts, that we would walk in whatever relational need we need to walk in, that we would make the crooked places straight. And Father, that we would walk in forgiveness, obedience, surrender. We let control leave our life. 
And truly, we'd find the joy of the Lord that would give us strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're supposed to do this after worship, but there wasn't time. There was a lot of things happening that were way more important, like focusing on Jesus and that sound. So I'm going to invite the team that's going to Florida. They head out on the 17th, and we got a missions trip, and I just want to bring them up and pray over them. If you could, so if you're headed out to Florida to serve those, perfect. And I think this group is fully funded. You're good. Okay. No money requests for this one. But if you guys would stand with me and extend your hands out, we want to pray for them and bless them. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Florida team. Thank you that they're going, that their yes is their yes. We pray that you would bless their travel. Um, bless John's back. I know his back went out a couple weeks ago, and there's some disc issues. And we just pray for restoration in the back, that the plane flight there and back, and the work, and the painting, and the projects that they have, that your hand would be on him. We just pray for a divine healing right now in Jesus' name. We just pray that you would override the prescribed medicine and you would heal it. You would restore his back. You would return anything that's deteriorated. You would restore the discs and the, um, the cartilage between, Lord, that he would have full mobility um, and function in Jesus' name. And bless this team. Thank you for the finances that provided for it. Thank you for the obedience. Thank you for the administration. And as we partner with Conway of Hope, we just pray that we would that the hand on the plow that we're uh, going to Florida, that it would be a hundredfold return, Lord, not just there, but here. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And Rebecca, you had a word. I think that's important that you share that. If As Rebecca's coming up with the ministry team, you guys can, st you're a part of the ministry team, so you have to stay up here and pray for people. Yeah. Ministry team, if you would come up and pray, Rebecca has a word, I think, so on the way here, um, the Lord started giving me a word for, I believe it's a man. He grew up in a family um, that didn't quite know what to do with him because he had the gift of a brilliant mind. And in the process of growing up in that, um, you, you, uh, they, it, it, you felt that they were unkind towards you, I'll just say. Um, and so... So what I was seeing as I was driving here um, was that you're a man um, and, you, and you have the gift of a brilliant mind, but you're also a little frustrated because you don't feel like you're, you've reached your potential um, because you have such a, a gift from the Lord and um, you even really doubt that you have a gift. So what I saw, I saw the name Richard in red... Um, letters. I don't know if that's your name. I don't know if you go by that name, if that's your given name, but I'm throwing that out there. But I felt like the Lord wanted to touch you today and um, j just to give you a touch. And if you would come up, that would be great. I'd love to pray for you. Um, is there anyone here that by that name or by that um, description that I gave? Maybe you're a little, huh? Yeah, you grew up in a home. You had a brilliant, is that you, Rob? You're, you're Robert. But anyway, so, so I'll just wait. You think about it. Richard doesn't have to be your name, but come on up. Amen. Thank you for that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the words that were given today. And thank you for the courage uh, that they were given. Thank you that your presence is here. I just continue to pray that um, the soil of this church would be, be tilled, continue to till it, Lord, that we would be a church that's hungry for you, that's hungry for your glory and your fire. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.